The year is 1987. In a couple of days before he is scheduled to officially accept the Nobel Prize in Literature, the Russian poet in exile, Joseph Brodsky, is in Vienna, Austria. He is attending a conference there on the topic of literature in exile, and as he is about to deliver his remarks, he pauses and addresses his audience. Let us imagine and pause for a minute let us think about some of those who quite naturally could not make it to this room today, he says. Let us imagine, for instance, Turkish gastarbeiters prowling the streets of West Germany, uncomprehending or envious of the surrounding reality. Or let us imagine Vietnamese boat people bobbing on high seas or already settled somewhere in the Australian outback. Let us imagine Mexican people crawling through the ravines of Southern California, past the border patrols, and into the territory of the United States. Well, we may stop here, because the minute of imagining has passed, although a great many could be added to this list. Brodsky went on to remind his fellow intellectuals, writers, and scholars of their responsibility to make the condition of exile less frightening and, if possible, easier for the next arrival. The poet's words resonate with the state of the world today as much as they did 30 years ago. And like Brodsky, I believe that literature in general, and poetry in particular, could render an active agent of change or at the very least provide a coping mechanism. And it was with this in mind that I set out to explore in my work how the poetic voice of someone like Brodsky, uprooted and transported to a whole new world, coped with the loss of place brought about exile on the poetic stage. What kind of spaces did it construct? How did it move between them? And what I discovered was fascinating to me. This talk's title hinted at a little bit of physics, and here it is. Brodsky's poetry showed an abundance of wide open spaces, vast horizons, expansive skies, islands growing into continents, windows fluttering and shutters opening, a poetic voice moving outwards and a poetic gaze fixed upwards. Brodsky's poetry of exile is centrifugal or moving away from a center. So I was interested in the spaces of exile, but I was also interested in its faces. And I looked at the poetry of one of Brodsky's early mentors, Anna Akhmatova, a renowned Russian poet in her own right. She is not traditionally considered a poet, a figure of exile. She rarely left the physical borders of the Soviet Union. However, she was repressed, censored, and eventually denounced as a decadent half harlot, half nun by the Soviet authorities. Some of her loved ones were persecuted and in some cases executed. I believe Akhmatova was in a state of internal exile. And her poetry showed a tendency to move in words and withdraw, ice thickening on the windows, the lyrical voice finding herself beneath a landslide on the ruins, trapped under the branches of the hovering trees above. Akhmatova's poetry of exile is centripetal moving towards a center. And as I go through my research and look for ways to expand it to other Slavic contexts as well, I'm reminded once again why poetry matters. It can capture and document the various phases of exile in human plight. It can help us understand the condition better, and while it can't solve a lot of issues for us, although I really wish it could, it can remind us to be kind. Thank you.